I'd like to talk about electricity in general, if I can, first of all. And uh, to me, as a, as a scientist by background, and not just any old scientist, but a fundamental scientist, a sort of scientist who goes into science because I want to learn about the universe, um, I think that's a very worthwhile thing to do. My current role is in communication at CERN, so I spent a long time preaching to my community that we have to go out and convince people that curiosity-driven research is worthwhile in its own right. Um, in recent years, I've found out that we actually don't have to do that because people think it is anyway. If you do opinion surveys and you ask people, do you know what's inside an atom, they say, I haven't got a clue. If you say, is it worthwhile, they say, of course it is. If you ask them how the universe works, they haven't got a clue. Is it worthwhile knowing, investigating? Of course it is. It's part of being human. So one of the things that we're, we're, we're very keen now to say is, is if you look back in history, anything you take for granted today, anything at all, you know, any gadget you like, be it your mobile phone, your computer, whatever, um, and you trace it back far enough, there's somebody who was curious at the beginning of it. Now, my favourite example is Faraday, actually, and Faraday is the reason we have electricity. And we don't have electricity because Faraday thought, I want to make this sort of stuff that will make light bulbs and computers and everything. He just saw natural phenomena and was curious about them. And Faraday is very unusual amongst uh, great scientists of the past. Most of them are people like you know, Ernest Rutherford, who famously is misquoted as saying you know, the idea that you might get energy out of an atom is pure moon moonshine. He didn't think it could happen. Most scientists don't see the applications of their work, but people are sufficiently creative, inventive, that they always find something to do with whatever fundamental science throws up. And Faraday was the exception because he famously said to Gladstone, who asked him what the value of his work was, one day, sir, you may tax it. So that's it. Yeah, that, that would be, to me, the most fundamental message that I would, would like to get across about um, electricity, all the things we take for granted today, is that fundamental research is the driver for it. So to go on to efficiency, though, again, I work in a, I work in a laboratory, which um, <coughs> is a big and expensive place to run. And uh, our tools are called particle accelerators, and our biggest one is called the Large Hadron Collider, and when it's running at full tilt, it consumes the same amount of electricity as the domestic consumption of the city of Geneva. That's a lot of energy. Right? It's a lot of energy. I mean, by the time you spread it out across our 20 member states, it's not so much, but nevertheless, it's something that makes us think we want to be efficient about using this. So one of the things that we do in the lab is we are constantly driving for forward technology that allows us to operate these big machines more efficiently than ever before. So the one that we're, we're in the process of switching on now, so the process of switching on one of these machines, um, is something like 70 to 100 times more powerful in terms of its research re reach as its predecessor, but its energy consumption is identical to its predecessor, and that's because we've pushed the technology envelope forward. So that, for me, that's one of the, the, the important messages. Another one, when people ask me about what, what CERN's yeah, concerns energy consumption, how green we are. Well, the most famous equation in physics, or possibly in science, is E equals mc squared. And what that tells you is that the E means energy on one side, and m on the other side means mass, and c squared is a very, very, very big number. So what this equation tells you is that in a tiny bit of mass, there is an awful lot of energy. Now, mo I wouldn't say most, but a lot of the energy that we use, certainly if you live in France, as I do, today comes out of that equation. E equals mc squared is what nuclear power stations do. You take a small amount of mass, you extract the energy from it, and you get a, you get a lot of energy to, to, to power people's homes. Um, what we do at CERN is we take that energy from the French nuclear uh, power network and we run the equation backwards. So we pump that energy in to create mass in the form of the particles that we want to study. And why am I talking about all this? Because you know, nuclear, the word nuclear has become a, uh, you know, a rude word, actually. And not without reason, you know, that, uh, that what, what happens in a power station, if you don't moderate it and control it, you can make a bomb. And what happens in power stations is that when, what, what you do is you get a, a great big heavy nucleus and you split it into smaller things and out that, that weigh less, so you've, you've converted that mass into energy. But the daughter things, the things that are produced, um, are very tricky to deal with. They can, they're radioactive, they have lifetimes of, of sometimes thousands of years, you've got to deal with that. And yeah, I, I think it's probably quite fair to say that the nuclear industry embarked on the first wave without really knowing how to do that. Um, but now, energy demand in the world is rising. Renewables are going to help. All kinds of things have got to help. But I think that nuclear has to be part of the equation. And one of the things that I find very interesting, a relatively recent development, came out of CERN, actually, one of our previous directors called Carlo Rubio, who's a Nobel Prize winning physicist, proposed in the mid-90s 
that you might couple the sort of technologies that we use with particle accelerators at CERN to a nuclear reactor using a different kind of fuel. And the fuel that he proposed is, is a, another heavy element called thorium instead of uranium. The big difference between thorium and uranium is that when you pump a neutron into a uranium atom, you get energy, door to products, three neutrons. That's why, if you're not careful, the reaction can run away. One neutron in, three neutrons out. Imagine that multiplying up. So in a power station, you absorb all the extra neutrons and you have a controlled reaction. In a bomb, you don't. But if thorium, very similar, neutron comes in, the atom breaks up, daughter products come out. In this case, they're stable or they have short half-lives, so you don't have a storage problem, and you get one neutron out. So the problem with that idea for energy generation is that the reaction isn't self-sustaining. So the, new, not the, the, ca the efficiency for catching a neutron is not 100%. So after a while, the thing just fizzles out and you don't get energy out of it. So his idea was build a little particle accelerator, use it to provide neutrons, pump them into the, uh, the thorium vessel, drive the reaction, and if you get more energy out than it costs to run the particle accelerator, you're in business. You've got clean nuclear energy. And that's an idea that, that sat around for a long, long time, for reasons that I don't really understand. But now it, people are starting uh, in India, I believe, to build prototype facilities that do this. And at CERN, it's a good thing really. CERN exists, the place I work exists to do pure blue sky research. We are forbidden by our convention from doing applied research unless there are extenuating circumstances such as there's nowhere else in the world that could do it and it's important that we, we make the odd exception. So for this idea, all we did was test the basic ideas, the basic science, and the basic science all hangs together. And when we tested the basic science, we also just thought, well, if we produce this little particle accelerator making neutrons, could we do something about the existing nuclear stockpile? Could we take plutonium, put it in there, pump neutrons into it, break it down into stable things? The answer is yes. Could we use this technology to develop medical isotopes for use in hospitals? By Again, by the same technique, putting neutrons into elements, breaking them up into things that are useful in medicine? The answer is yes. So this technology, this idea that came out of CERN by a you know, particle physicist proposed it, offers you a possibility, there's a lot of R&D to be done, so I'm not going to say it's a panacea or anything, it's a possibility to have clean, environmentally friendly nuclear energy without the storage problem that helps deal with the storage problem that we've got and provides isotopes for medicine. So to me, that's, a, that's, a, you know, that's an exciting development, something to watch. And uh, as I said, I believe it's beginning, the Indian government is beginning to invest in this sort of thing now for very good reason. They have large population, they have increasing energy demands. They also sit on top of a very large percentage of the world's deposits of thorium, which we're looking at. Very, very interesting. As a subsidiary question to our presence here at Lyft, if you were given the amount of the carbon footprint for the Lyft conference, which they reckon to be roughly a thousand Swiss francs, what would you do with that sum? A thousand Swiss francs, where can you go with that these days? Um, I don't really know, but I know the sort of direction I would like to go in it. And I heard a talk that came just after mine that I found um, quite inspiring actually. And the reason why is because this was somebody who's doing at a grassroots level something that makes a real difference. And um, I'm very skeptical about initiatives that, that we can make a difference. You know, that by, by not getting plastic bags from the supermarket you're going to make a difference. I don't actually buy that. And for a long time I've been convinced that if we want to make a difference it's got to come from government. It's got to be something that's driven from above. And uh, one of the reasons why I, you know, one of the things that, that, that reinforce that prejudice, if you like, is reading James Lovelock, I mean, the founder of the Gaia movement, who says, I'm going to keep flying, I'm going to use plastic carrier bags, because too little, too late, we can't make any difference, we're headed for a catastrophe, <coughs> but I'm optimistic, because human beings are best in, in crisis situations, so it's only when we get there that we'll find our way out. Now, that might be a bit depressing, but I, it sort of resonated. But there was somebody there saying, you know, by doing very, very small things, like putting little patches of greenery in front of fire hydrants, you can really make a difference. So that's a nice in initiative. So I'd like to invest this money in something that's producing you know, grassroots initiatives that can really make a difference, not like just swapping your plastic carrier bags for one that lasts 10 trips to the supermarket instead of one. Do you have any particular grassroots initiative in mind? I don't really know. I mean, I just I liked I liked her. I'd give it to her. Why not? <laughs> give okay. it to her environmental health clinics because I think that's a lovely uh, lovely concept. A grassroots initiative for environmental health clinics. Yeah. Uh, James Gillies, thank you very much. Pleasure.